Hey there everyone, my name is Itesh and I make coding videos. And in this video, we are not talking about coding, but the DevOps side of the world. Now, whenever you're learning DevOps, maybe let's just assume that you have studied a bit of a Linux basics, maybe some principles of DevOps in general, maybe Docker and Kubernetes, and you're thinking, now I need to some see or get some exposure in the company. So look at let's look at the roles, what they are offered. And to your surprise, in the world of DevOps, if you look for DevOps engineer, there are hardly any roles which are mentioned. If they are mentioned, they are mentioned with really high experience. And you're wondering, is DevOps really meant for fresher or not? It is. These days, companies do hire people with considerably less experience in the DevOps and even freshers are given a lot of chances. Why? Because there's a shot of such engineers. Now, a lot of people start the journey of just the coding and programming, but eventually they realize I know coding and basics, I know the decent part of it, but I enjoy more in the infrastructure side of it. Or maybe you are not interested in the coding at all, you are just more interested in the infrastructure side of it. But you don't know how to apply for those jo jobs or even how to look for those jobs. This video is exactly going to help you with the skill sets that you need for this kind of a job, the tools that you use in this job, what's your responsibility in this job, and what can you learn uh, from this open world of internet or YouTube to go with that. And by the way, there is no course in the description, no nothing like that, it's just open knowledge that I wanted to share about the SRE, the Site Reliability Engineer. And this made me realize probably there can be my Udemy courses, but they are not on the DevOps anyways. So let me walk you through on the description uh, on the screen itself and walk you through with that. So. Let's talk about the most important concept and the job role, which is what is SRE or the Site Reliability Engineer. When you look for the DevOps role, you're going to see a lot of time the Site Reliability role as a job profile. And at first, it can confuse anyone that, am I going to maintain the reliability of the site? How am I going to do that? Is it a developer role or is it a DevOps role? Let me just jump on to the fact this is a DevOps role. This is a pure DevOps role, but the naming is a little bit of confusion in itself. And you'll even be confused when you ask anybody that what is a site reliability engineer? They will say that it's kind of a mix of, it's kind of a blend of software engineering plus operations to create the scalable and reliable system. I understand the scalable reliable system, but this definition of software engineering plus operations, this is the whole DevOps. Uh, kind of a no. This is specifically being attached with the SRE and the whole uh, guy or the person behind it is actually Google. So this was the term coined by the Google itself and every big tech company, Google, Netflix, Paytm, PhonePay, all of them have this site reliability engineer and their reliability doesn't just belong to the development part. Actually, their reliability sometimes moves into the data science role as well. Yes, there are SREs for data science companies as well. It's a very interesting role. It's a very high paying role, which bridges the gap most considerably in the development side and the operation side. Even this guy decides that how frequently our our code is going to go in the production because there's something known as error budgeting. I'll come on to that. So how do you find the error budgeting and how much error budgeting is allowed to you and can that increase the code that goes in the production or that can decrease the code that can go in the production? So we're going to talk about that. That's an interesting one. So let's go with that. So this goes uh, beyond just the monitoring, automation and resilience reliability. This actually decides a lot of things, even with the legal team as well, that how much can we offer for that? Sounds interesting? It is. It takes a lot of business decision and all of that. So I hope this gets you equally excited about that. And let's talk about what is SRE. So now that you know the definition and what you'll be doing, let's go into this. This term was coined by the Google itself. And yes, Google does that naming. It's not really the best of the naming, but it does the job. And it's a operation is a software problem. This is the whole philosophy that was designed that why we are calling it as SRE because SRE or the operations cannot be just an operation problem, cannot be just an infrastructure problem. It needs to combine with the software. So we will use all the software best practices and how people write software and follow the philosophy there. We're gonna follow same kind of a philosophy in the operations as well or in the infrastructure as well. And thus the name was coined by the Google itself. So what do you do? The first step is you actually check the uptime and reliability. You automate the operations 
instead of the manual firefighting, you automate the things. And yes, in case you are, some things are coming to your mind that terraforms and so, yes, that is also a part of SRE. And the most important thing, you actually measure the reliability with these three terms, which you are going to hear a lot. SLIs, SLOs, and SLAs. Acronyms. Everybody hates that. But don't you worry. I do have a section. I do have notes where I'll walk you through with each one of this. This is, these are only the whole three things through which your entire day and entire month revolves as an SRE. I will come on to that. So, what are examples where SRE is actually heavily involved? The things that you hear about in the companies like Netflix, like Netflix introduced a stuff which is known as Chaos Monkey, which is deliberately breaking the production instance, uh, instances to test the re resilience. This is one of the job of your SRE to actually put the measures that the site doesn't break, but it's also your job to introduce these kinds of attacks like Netflix Chaos Monkey so that you can sit with the development team and see that, okay, these are the things that I have done. Do you have some input? And during that high chaos, can we ship the code to the production? Yes, this kind of a talk. And this is a very serious one. And the Google Gmail uptime goal is 99.9. So how do they actually measure these kinds of roles? And if something goes below that or above that, how do you even measure that? That's interesting. So first of all, let's talk about what are your day-to-day -day responsibility. So when you become an SRE, of course, I will walk you through with the skills required and everything, but let's just first look at from a bird's eye perspective that what does the SRE do in day-to-day -day life? So the first one is monitor your health. Day in and day out, there is a dashboard on your screen or some of the other screen which monitors the key matrices. And especially that includes uh, the database of time, your, all of your pipelines are up, and all of your major websites which you are promising to serve to the user are up and not. Yes, literally that are always opened up, kind of always opened up on your screen. That's one of your major responsibility. Then another thing that comes under your belt is automate the deployment, scaling and recovery so that, that's important part, so that your developers are comfortable as well as they don't have to wait too much for that. How much weight the developer are going to do is heavily dependent on you itself what kind of mechanism you are putting up. Another thing is uh, define the SLOs, SLIs, what reliability do user expect. So let's just say you promise you are a payment gateway and you are promising a company that our payment gateway goes is staying up 98% of the time. What 98%? 98% of the day, 98% of the month, throughout the life. You might have noticed that Amazon AWS also provides that 99.99999 kind of SLAs. But what are these SLAs? What are these SLIs? So this is one of the thing. So SLI is a service level indicator. This is a matrix that measure how a system is performing. You might have seen some of the website which gives you those green dots on some another website that our system is all up and running. Our system is all functioning. This is SLI, the service level indicator. There are tools available in market. Uh, tools like Site24 by 7, they actually gives you this up, uptime monitoring and these kinds of graphs that which system are up 100% up which are not, when was the last incident happened and all of these things. And yes, people should know transparently that how much is the uptime and when was the incident that happened. For example, 99.95% of the HTTP response return a successful code. So your SLI is 99.95. How long you have been measuring that based on that data and actually people require proof of that. And that's why uh, the companies like Uptime Monitor product by the Managed Indian 24 by 7 is used Look at the companies, Disney's and Shine and Bajaj, FinServe and Ford. They use that because it is required sometimes by law and sometimes by providing services to anyone. Another thing that you're going to see is SLO, which is service level objective. This is where you target that if I'm providing SLI, how can I sit with the developers and instead of offering 98% to move it to 99% or 99.9%, and you'll be surprised to know that some companies even provide 99.99999% for a year. So that means that our website can only go like five minutes in a year down. Yeah, that kind of a level promise is there. So how can we increase the rolling windows? And based on this, if our this SLO is going down, we need to probably release less in the production so that at least we can legally whatever we have promised, we can serve that. Even if it that is the cost of releasing less code in the production, so that it be. You take that decision. So yes, it is a very interesting role. And then comes the SLA, which is a service level agreement. 
And this is a formal contract between the service provider and the customer that includes consequences. Yeah, that's the highlight word. Like refunds or credits and sometimes even the nasty court cases. Whatever you have promised and if you have written this in the SLA, that needs to be served. And if it is not being served, that might incur a loss to the company, that might incur some fine to the company as well. Yes, this is a serious business. So example, if the uptime drops below 99.9%, .9%, the provider gives customer 10% bill credit. Now imagine if the bill was worth 10 crores, yes, you are the engineer who is directly responsible for these kinds of things. So this is a very challenging and very exciting role. So coming back onto that. So these are the things where we have these SLOs and stuff. And I think now you understand the importance of things like uptime monitoring. Why do websites pay so much for uptime monitoring? It is not an option. It is a requirement. They have to do this. And if you look at this, uh, full stack uptime monitoring for website, server, network, cloud. You need to monitor everything. It's not like my network is down or my cloud service is down, but rest of the things are up. You can't do that. You have to have to go with that. And actually, this is not just about it. Actually, uh, Site24 by 7, if you look at their uh, product itself, they have so many things about monitoring network traffic and OCI and GCPs and log management and all of that. But for this particular video and for the SRE people, I think yeah, the uptime monitoring solution is one of the one which you are looking forward for that. It looks for the server uptime monitoring, avoid server overload with reliable uptime, maybe the application that you are using, maybe that is causing a lot of load on the server. And if you look at this, how many processes are there, availability, the CPU usage, you can see all kind of monitoring in that. And along with that, the networking. So how your network is looking like, how is your Cisco and the Juniper hardwares are doing all of that, maybe you need to change that. A lot of companies are on their on-prem hardwares as well. And you can see the term again here, SLA. And notice here, the exact keywords. Track your service status, define the service level agreement, SLA, and build your business credibility. Again, the exact same terms which we studied there, they are actually common day-to-day -day word for every single one. And we have a lot of things, and by the way, don't want to spoil the surprise here, otherwise they, they actually mention everything. Notice this, status page. How do companies get status page? And if I go ahead and search for any status page, you will find them. So for example, if I go ahead and say the Razor Pay uh, service status, uh, so you will find a status page hosted on a different subdomain, the payment API, uh, status over 90 days, so they have to track by the law 90 days in itself, checkouts, how the checkout, and notice here, this is where stuff happened. So degraded for four hours, degraded for 23 minutes. People need to know how reliable your service and how do they do it through these tools. Notice here, payment links. So this is where the incident, so if your revenue dropped for those five years, and uh, those five hours, and you have no idea how it happened, this is how it happened. And who is responsible? Maybe they have SLA with some of the people. Everyone have this. So if you just look for it, uh, Vercel service status, they also have. Every company have this. So notice here, Vercel status. All of the incidents are clearly reported and having up there. So anyways, let's move on. I know this is interesting. All right. So now, incident response and postmortem. you are responsible for reporting the incident, not just to your organization, sometimes to publicly disclose that. And yes, again, very heavy role. And postmortems of that, what caused it, maybe sometimes you write an entire article that what was the incident and how we got back with the role. Collaborate with developers and reduce the uh, release risk. If the already you have consumed all of your time, like the another release, and if even if accidentally it burst up in the production, we will lose our SLA. So we cannot allow you to push in the production. Happens. And you think every time you are doing just a git push, nah, it doesn't work like that. So one of the key things that you do is error budgets. And I'll walk you through. So uptime percentage and the latency threshold as the SLI promises, you are the one who are doing these error budgeting. How much errors are remaining so that we can th push the things in the production and it will be fine. Even if it's a downtime, that's okay for us. You are responsible for that. And you also do the incident management as well. You do the on-call rotation and you do the incident response playbook as well. You write those playbook literally. If the incident happens, what we will do? Step one, we will not panic. <laughs> it's there in always all playbook. Step two, we will not blame anyone. It is also there usually. Then we will look into the logs or probably first we will report to the user, yes, we are facing the incident. 
Step two, we will go and look at the logs and we will bring the all call engineer. If the issue doesn't resolve in X amount of time, we will bring a senior engineer on the all call. Everything is done by the playbook. You write that playbook. So what are the tools that you use for the SRE? Interesting stuff. So the stuff that you use is monitoring and APM for application. A uh, whole metrics is being uh, traced up here and they are actually offered by the site 24 by 7. They are probably the, one of the biggest player in the market, which are also the cheapest player in the market. And that's why they're the only one. And uh, you also do the alerting as well. So there are dedicated mobile apps available for the pager duty and these ops genie. There are others as well, but these are the one I found for the first. I have majorly seen pager duty and we also have seen that. So these are the mobile apps which are available. Whoever is the engineer who is on the responsibility of such things, if any incident happens, they actually see really, really bad alarm. I hate that alarm tone, but it is what it is. So they get this alarm as soon as they get the call, they are responsible for be on to the call itself and resolve the bug as long as it takes. It can be 2 a.m. in the night or 3 a.m. or it can be 5 p.m. Doesn't really matter. You are on the duty. Somebody needs to do that. Usually engineers do get paid more for that duty, but depends on where you are working. And then we have the logging as well. You can use ELK stack as well. But again, the biggest player in this one is again Manage Engine. They have a product Log360 as well. But what I recommend to people is just go into the pricing segment itself. And uh, most of the companies that I'm seeing here is they go for all in one. Like for just 3,000 or 8,000, we get all of this. So let's get all of it and just not worry about anything at all. You have everything. Notice here, 150 SMS and voice credits per month. Why? Because you will need that. <laughs> Some incidents do happen. Three basic status uh, pages in status IQ and all of this. So yeah, by the way, you can buy more and more of them as well. You'll see the pricing. They are actually for a corporate status, like if you look at from the perspective now from the Vercel, Paytm, uh, Razorpay, this is not even money for them. <laughs> so anyways, so what's the career path? Finally, good question. Uh, so what do you need for SRE? SRE, now that you understand, it's a high stake role. And yes, you can directly go there, but you will not be provided that much of high responsibility. But these are the, like some people say you don't need any programming background or something. But what I have noticed, you need at least the basics of programming. It can be Python, it can be Go, it can be JavaScript, but at least the bare minimum foundation of programming is required because you will be talking to developers. And if you don't understand their language, their loops, function, what they name and how they work, you won't be surviving for long. So don't love the programming for the sake of loving it, but at least get the basics done. You also need cloud and Kubernetes knowledge. Not Kubernetes, depends on where you're applying, but this is a high stake role, so maybe that kind of a thing come into the picture. And get friendly with the monitoring and observability tool. Again, get friendly with these things, deploy them, learn them, sign up into them, uh, create an account, at least get familiar with how kind of a da what kind of a dashboard is given to you so that you don't feel overwhelmed in the job itself. And incident response, this is something that you learn when you see the seniors, how they are reporting and playbooks and all of that. And by the way, there are other typical roles as well, which are available in the same categories. So SRE engineer is the one role that you will be seeing. The reliability architect, yeah, that's a fancy name. And there's a platform engineer, SRE is of course there. So these are a couple of roles which are available uh, up there. So you know the skills now, you know the roles, you can prepare and uh, go for this. This is a very interesting job role and people say it's just programming. No, it's not. There are thousands of roles in the entire infrastructure. And I highly recommend you to go ahead and check out the Manage Engine, especially Site24 by 7. They have been really helpful for me and uh, they are the OG players in the market itself. So that was it. And if you need more such kind of a videos, which helps you to understand what the job role is, what I do day to day in, and how can I prepare for that? I would love to make more videos. Let me know in the comment section. I'll do it. That is it for this video and let's catch up in the next one.